Hello everyone! Welcome to a special G0 live stream. We're coming to you live today from Davos, Switzerland, site of the 2023 World Economic Forum. I'm Nicholas Thompson, CEO of The Atlantic. This program is part of the award-winning Global Stage series, produced in partnership between G0 Media and Microsoft. Global Stage brings you conversations about issues at the intersection of technology, politics, and society, like today's discussion, which is a great example of that. We're talking about artificial intelligence and the risks and rewards disruptive technologies present to the world. I'm joined today by Brad Smith, Vice Chair and President of Microsoft. Eileen Donahoe, Executive Director of the Global Digital Policy Incubator at Stanford University and former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Human Rights Council. Azim Azar, tech expert and founder of the influential newsletter Exponential View. And Ian Bremmer, founder and president of Eurasia Group and G Zero Media. Welcome to you all. Let's start. Ian, hello. Lovely hey. day. How are you doing? Good to be back. Great. You just published a top risks report. All the things we need to worry the hell about things that are going to disrupt the world. You said it's a tipping point for AI. What did you mean? What's up? Well, first of all, it's the first time in the history of the firm that AI has actually written uh, the name of a risk. We put the risk in mm -hmm. and the chat GPT, which I'm sure we're going to talk about, and it came up with weapons of mass disruption, which frankly was pretty damn good. Um, and uh, we've been talking about climate change here at the World Economic Forum for decades. It's a big super tanker. We know it's getting worse. We've talked about sort of geopolitical tectonics and the growing challenges of Russia and China and the US. AI has been kind of bumping along the bottom of the road and then suddenly, wow, taking off like a shot. This does feel like a transformative moment. A transformative moment for productivity, for hope, for efficiency, for connectivity. Also, of course, a transformative moment for danger, for disruption in the hands of bad actors. And this is an environment, geopolitically, where rogue actors are more powerful than they've ever been in the history of the world. I mean, we have a number of individuals who have enormous power concentrated in their hands and the willingness and capacity to make really bad decisions on the basis of really poor information without checks and balances around them. We see that in Iran. We see that in Russia. We also increasingly even see that in China. Empowered by tools like artificial intelligence that can become weapons in the wrong hands, that is, and Brad talks about this, that is something that can become transformative for the geopolitical environment. It's never been a risk in 25 years of Eurasia Group. It is this year. All right, Brad, there are two ways that Ian could be wrong. He could be wrong that it's a risk right now. He could also be wrong that this is the tipping moment. No. Is he wrong in either of those ways, or is he right that actually this really is the tipping point? I do think Ian is right in both of these respects. Mm, it's too bad. Makes it less interesting here. <laughs> we will disagree on other stuff. Yeah. I'm fairly certain. We'll get to it. <laughs> think about the history of technology, and there are certain inflection points. And there are certain inflection points when a technology really is embraced by the public. And then, frankly, life is not the same again. The most recent was probably 2007, when the introduction of the iPhone transformed the movement towards mobility. It's easy to forget that until 2007, Microsoft was actually the leader in smartphones, and Apple took this leap forward. The same thing was true in 1995 when Netscape's web browser suddenly pushed us all into this new internet era. Phones existed before 2007. The World Wide Web existed before 1995. The AI has existed. It's been a topic of discussion now for six or seven years at Davos, but this is the year. I do believe 2023 will be the year that is remembered as the inflection point because these large language or foundational models are enabling people to do things they didn't believe would be possible really even this decade. And it's going to be used in so many ways for good and in ways that create new risks and challenges as well. All right, so Azim, do you believe that um, the reason we're at a tipping point is actually because the AI advanced substantially and these large language models you know, finally figured it out? Or is it just because OpenAI built a really simple to use interface and we started to use it and actually we're overestimating the technological advance that we've made in the last year? Uh, I think it, it's a technological advance. I think the uh, ChatGPT and the work they've done and other companies are building similar sorts of things do, do represent new advances on technology. But there's a second thing that's happened, which is firms like Microsoft and, and others over the last seven or eight years have been helping large corporates get ready for AI. And they've been 
getting them tooled up. They've been getting the data in place. They've been getting the skills in place. So all the big firms who control the way we interface with our bank accounts and our travel schedules, they are now much, much better placed than ever to implement AI systems, thanks to the help of Microsoft and others. And now they've got a really, really great technology on which to do that. Uh, and I think that those two things combined to make 2023, sorry to agree with Ian, a tipping point year. Can I ask, maybe I'll put this to anybody, um, why did this huge advance, which has created this tipping point, which is OpenAI, why did it come from a reasonably small company and not one of the gigantic companies that has had thousands of engineers on AI? I've heard a couple of hypotheses in Davos, one of which is that the large companies actually do have it, but they can't release it because of regulators. And the other is, well, you know, it's easier to be a small company, be innovative. Brad, you can answer if you want, or somebody else can take a crack at it. Well, I'll offer a few thoughts. First, yeah, OpenAI has had the ability to move extraordinarily quickly because they have this relatively small group of 300 people who are extraordinarily talented, very focused, and unencumbered by, you know, frankly, what you often have in a large organization. While at the same time, they have had the benefit of a huge tech company behind them. It's not as if this OpenAI or any AI model with a large language model gets you know, constructed on a PowerPoint slide or a piece of paper. It's literally created with the benefit of an AI supercomputer, in this case an Azure supercomputer that was built in a dedicated and very expensive way by Microsoft. And what we should really recognize, in my view at this point, is that there are three institutions that are at the forefront of these large language models, and there will be others as well. But you have OpenAI with the benefit of the support of Microsoft. You have DeepMind, which is part of Google. And you have the Beijing Artificial Intelligence Institute. And then others as well. But this is, it is easy to create apps that harness the power of um, an AI model. But creating an AI model with billions of parameters, that is an extraordinarily computationally intensive approach. Now, I would say, and OpenAI created a better to use interface. Think about the smartphone and what touch interface did. It transformed it. It made the power of the technology more accessible. I think this is a liftoff point because it's true. Everybody's been getting ready to use this type of thing and becoming more familiar. But it has been a genuine technological advance, nonlinear advance, in my view, in the size and the capability of the model itself. And when was the last time you really heard anyone in the tech industry? When have you ever heard anyone in the history of the tech industry say, I have a product, it is so good, I just can't show it to you because regulators won't let me. I have heard a number of people in the tech industry say that we had the product, we just couldn't release it because the regulators, but let's go to someone who knows a lot about regulation. What is a good framework, right? So we have yep. this thing. It's, we can talk about the specifics about ChatGPT and AI, but how do you think about getting regulations right when there's an emerging technology that could just be awesome or yep. just be so destructive? Yeah, so let me go backwards and just say, I haven't heard that it's because of regulation. I've heard that it's proprietary interest of Google and DeepMind wanting to keep it in their own hands as opposed to this experimental iterative d release approach that OpenAI has taken. And so uh, that's a really interesting question to me, the pros and cons of, you know, there's some companies releasing it to the wild, there's risks of that, there's some like OpenAI that's done this iterative partial pilot, and then there's others that keep it in-house. And so the pros and cons of that, I think, is something worth debating. In terms of a framework, um, so I am a human rights person, and so, from the human rights point of view, I think it's interesting to look at, as Brad said, you know, the past decade, or you said six or seven years here at Davos, the human rights conversation around implications of AI for human rights. And then I can touch a little bit on this moment and all the energy around generative AI and the progress and this release of ChatGPT. Human rights point of view, there's sort of three levels of conversation happening. The first of which is the most dominant and obvious, which is what are the actual implications of things that have been integrated already. There's civil political rights, that's the part everybody knows about. The obvious concerns are equal protection, non-discrimination, 
um, right to privacy, exercise of civil liberties, you know, panopticon level surveillance from AI, uh, those kinds of things. And I would say on the civil political rights, m most of it has been about risk, less yet on reward. Economic, social, cultural right conversation is about um, who enjoys the benefits. And even though there's been a lot of concern about jobs and displacement of people from work, I think there's been a bigger emphasis on the potential rewards of inclusion in the AI revolution. And so that's kind of an interesting tension. Second level is this more speculative conversation about AGI. And what are the implications for humans and humanity? Um, obviously, the, the concern, uh, well, what do we even mean by replicating right. human intelligence? Are we, and are we talking about human consciousness or human awareness? Um, so, th so that's one, one level. And then the third level, which, Brad, you talk about, Ian, you two all the time, is the geopolitical. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where the human rights community really has to step up and wake up because AI as a foundational technology um, will have dramatic, has had, and will continue to have dramatic implications for economic superiority, military superiority, and really the power to shape global norms. And so it is really important that it's the dominance in this foundational technology remain in the hands of democratic stakeholders and people who care about human rights. Well, that leads so nicely into our poll, but I will add, on AGI, I was just at a panel where we talked about the most interesting risk I've heard of AGI, which is that if we have a chatbot that you can really emote with, people will fall in love with their chatbots, will stop mm -hmm. having babies, and then there'll be total demographic decline. Okay, but that is not the biggest risk, according to the survey. Um, so G0 surveyed lots of folks across social media ch channels. A ton of people responded, and we got some really good data. So the first question, the biggest threat that AI presents is potential for job loss coming in at 23%. Privacy and security risks came in at 35%. And dangerous to democracy was the big winner. Congratulations, dangerous to democracy, winning with 42%. <laughs> Ian, how did you vote? Uh, I would have voted dangerous to democracy. I mean, in our own polls, I don't, I don't tend to vote. But you know, you want to, want to keep the data clean. Uh, <laughs> but, but look, look it, it, it seems to me that we have, um, we're, we're in an environment where the last 30 years, right, you come to the WEF, and people are talking in various ways about the digital divide. I mean, ever since the internet has created who's on, who's off, you already talked about inclusivity, right? Mm -hmm. This year, so far, and it's almost the end of WEF, I have not heard anyone talking about digital divide. First of all, because the world is getting people connected. Secondly, because the pandemic's only speeding that process up. But third, because increasingly, that's not the problem. Increasingly, the problem is stuff you know that ain't really so. <laughs> and we've got people all over the world that are dealing with disinformation that is fundamentally ripping at the fabric of civil society in democracies everywhere. Now, last year at our global stage, Brad and I were talking, this was back in May, it was only a few months after the Russians invaded Ukraine, we were talking all about cyber. And we were worried about whether or not the Russians were going to be able to destroy Ukraine with their cyber offensive capabilities. And over the course of only a few months, we're feeling a lot more confident, Brad can talk about this, that cyber defenses, properly applied, actually are doing a really good job in beating away the strongest cyber attacks that the Russians have to deploy against Ukraine. And that's awesome. But we are nowhere close to that if you want to talk about disinformation, if you want to talk about influence, ca influence campaigns. Nowhere close, not only on Ukraine, but on Brazil, on, on elections all over the world, you name it. 37% of Brazilians right now are saying that they want military intervention to overthrow the Lula government, the largest democracy in South America. You know why? Because they know things that are completely untrue. And when you suddenly take those populations and they can no longer tell the difference between a real human being they're interacting with and a bot, you have threatened democracy. The only way I would change my response to that question is I wouldn't just say threat to democracy. I'd say threat to free market. Because we all remember meme stock. We all remember the GameStop scandal and how you had all of these crazy folks on Reddit that were saying, GameStop to the moon, even though there's no underlying value in the company whatsoever. Okay, what happens when on top of that, you have all of these individual speculators that should not be speculating that are suddenly being driven by thousands, millions of bots? I don't know how we deal with that. I don't think we're ready. And, and again, according to the people dealing with the defensive technologies, we aren't yet prepared 
for what's coming down the pipe. Is, he, is, is Ian right that the good guys are winning in cyber and the bad guys are winning in disinformation? Well, I think that the problem with disinformation is that it's not just the bad guys. I mean, these really powerful AI models that have come out this year, the large language models, good are adept liars. So even with the greatest of good intention, you use one of these models and you'll produce something that persuades you but has a mistake in it. Now, there's a Do they ever do the opposite when you're trying to lie and they tell you the truth? Well, I, I haven't tried that one. Uh, I, I, my, my heart is too pure for that sort of thing. But a, a, lead, a leading uh, tech news site uh, had been using one of these models to, to author articles over the last uh, few months. And they've started to have to pull, pull down dozens of them because there are lots of factual errors in them. There are lots of mistruths. And, and part of the problem with that is that if even in a good source, you can't tell what's really valid and what isn't, that starts to tear away, nibble away at our sense of what can we trust, what can we not trust. And I think that creates a sort of a foundation for the sorts of uh, terrible situations that, that Ian paints. Eileen, do we need policies around disinformation? Or do we just need social norms and education? Well, uh just social norms exactly. and education. Binary <laughs> choices. Um, the family. So I, I personally think we have not done enough on the cultural level. And we haven't done enough in terms of civic education. And I think the, the, the power of generative AI will take us to the ne next level in that category. I 100%, million percent agree with Ian that, that this technology is a dramatic risk to democracy and the integrity. You know, we depend on some level of integrity in the information realm. We have been dealing with the misinformation, disinformation problem for the last decade, or really since 2016, we've been facing it. This takes it to the next level and puts it on steroids. Um, so I think the harder question, though, and this is for regulators, is, is the instinct of dem democratic governments to going to be to ban these technologies, which is, I, I think you would say, is not even possible. It's not, it's not in the realm of possibilities. But there is some instinct, at least to ban some applications or really put, put a stop on it. And um, I know my, my partner at Stanford, Larry Diamond, world-renowned democracy scholar, is kind of like he doesn't like the fact that this stuff is being released. On the other side is you've got People at OpenAI, Sam Altman, Reid Hoffman, both, you know, really concerned and committed to future humanity, democracy, and they are convinced, and you know, we're all trusting them, that releasing this stuff, iterating on the release, and staying in the lead of development is really essential for the good guys. And so I'm trying to have confidence in that. They may have a stronger economic incentive for their opinion than Larry Diamond does for his, but we'll... Correct. And so but that doesn't mean they're wrong. Doesn't. OK, so let's, Brad, can, can I, can I you, Yes, you may. This. I would say, look, let's zoom out. First, I'll give you one area where I disagree with what Ian said. Excellent, thank you. If people at Davos are not talking about the digital divide, mm -hmm. that's a weakness at Davos. Fair mm -hmm. enough. Yep. There are still 3 billion people mm -hmm. who do not have access to the internet. And let's remember, there are 770 million people, more than twice as many who live in the United States, who don't yet have access to electricity, the greatest mm -hmm. invention of the 19th century. Right. Yeah. So we have a lot of work to do to get the world up to a common position where it can use this technology. Then I would say all of these risks, I agree, are real, and we need to take them very seriously. Um, you know, one thing I would say, my, my phrase for this week in Davos when it comes to AI is that 2023 is not, yet an, is not only an inflection point, it is the year when we should be curious, not judgmental. Mm -hmm. Let's go into all of this with our eyes wide open. Let's recognize mm -hmm. that, that we're seeing a nonlinear improvement in a technology in terms of its power, but it's also an iterative uh, advance in terms of everything it can do. You know, so you know, generate a false image. Yes, you could do that as soon as you had Photoshop, and then it keeps getting better. Generate text. That is false and deceptive. Yes, unfortunately, that goes back to the invention of writing, and it keeps getting better. All of this is a tool that can be used to inflict harm. It can also be a tool that is used to protect against that harm being inflicted. And it really means two things. First, it does go to when and how 
and for what purpose and under what terms is it released so that you have responsible AI controls? And second, how do you develop the capability to use it as a tool to combat the harms we should all worry about? Mm. Ian, you want to jump in there? What, I, I agree completely that this is a year to be curious and not judgmental. I also think that in a period of inflection point, being curious also means being hyper aware of when something is potentially an opportunity and hyper aware of when something is potentially a threat. Absolutely. I remember last year when there was a, an, an engineer, well-employed, thought of engineer at Google, that suddenly went rogue <laughs> because he was convinced that Google had created sentient intelligence. Yeah, he was in love. He was yeah, in love. Yes, he was. And I, br I brought that up because when Nick said, well, that's the main risk, mm -hmm. everyone talks about, oh, people are going to fall in love with their bots. And, right. and, and Brad and I both know some people that are developing AI right now that are you know, putting together these AI like kind of chat bot helpmate type things mm -hmm. that are meant to be very productive, but also that everyone is developing relationships with them in beta, which is kind of crazy. But the other side of that is when you can't tell the difference between a person and a bot, it's not just about developing a relationship with a bot that is human-like, it's also that your relationships with human beings will become bot-like. In other words, right now, when we engage with people, even though there are some places that are like a hellscape on social media, the fact is that we do think that our fellow human beings deserve a basic level of common humanity. We really do. We do better when we're in person than we're online, but still, it's a person at some level, and you can break through. When you no longer can tell the brain is going to yeah. wire itself to start treating human beings default like bots. And the impact that will have in divided societies, in divided democracies, I think, is one of these areas that we should not be judgmental. We should be curious, but we should be ready. We should yeah. be alert to that threat. I, you it's know, a we, very good point. I tell my me. kids not to kick the Roomba. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, to, to Ian's point, I mean, we can turn to the, the, the world's regulatory superpower, which is, of course, the EU. And in the, the new AI legislation will, if it gets passed, ban any AI system that mimics a human. It, you'll have to disclose that you're talking to a, a, a bot. Now, there's all sorts of questions of, of enforcement. How will you t tell? How will you, you chase down the person? This technology will be highly, highly uh, uh, d diffused. But there is at least some sense of some sensible hard lines that, that we can imagine regulators bringing out. But I also think that we're so aware of this risk, the risk, the ad adept liar risk that, that I described, that the developers of, developers of the technology themselves are aware of it and they're trying to tackle it. And, and for me, one of the most interesting that's, things that's happened with AI in the last week has been Microsoft's announcement that it's going to support these chat tools through its cloud platform. Because in my experience of Microsoft, it thinks very, very hard of, around, around these implications, right? I mean, I trust Brad's team to, to, to have been thoughtful about this. And I'm quite curious, I'm sorry to take your role for a second, Nicholas, but I'm quite curious about the thought process that went on in Microsoft given that you know that we're all sitting here saying this could destroy democracy, to make this thing broadly available? Because I trust your thinking. I'd just love to hear what it was. Well, we have a responsible AI infrastructure that is similar to what we have for privacy, security, and digital safety. Um, you know, and by that, we have principles, a policy. We have an organizational infrastructure. There is, there is training. There is testing. There are engineering tools. You know, there's work that goes on before a product is released. There's a, a testing of it afterwards. There are, there's a whole compliance regimen. You know, so you know, we do feel good, for example, not only about the API we released or announced on Monday was coming, including with access to the same technology as ChatGPT, even though that's going to advance very substantially, very quickly this year, as well as what it will mean, as Satya Nadella said, you know, to integrate this into all of our first party products, the operating system, application, search, all of these things, and we'll continue to have all of these controls. And really building on your point before, which I think is really quite important, you know, there, one of the huge advances that comes from this is the ability of, say, enterprise customers, government, NGO, business, to use it with their own data sets. You know, and I think in some ways, Chat GPT has gotten everybody so focused on one aspect of this, the generative AI, which I think should be a great tool for creative expression. There's the other side of this, which is, call it fact-fighting, a great tool for critical thinking, mm -hmm. so that people can find new insights, discover new facts. And all of that requires controls. And you know, it, it, 
we've all sort of lost, we've all gotten so excited, which is amazing on the one hand with a beta release mm -hmm. <laughs> that you know, we haven't yet seen the finished product. And because I get to work every day with the internal builds at Microsoft, you know, I'll be the first to say that in October, you know, when I was using what you are using today, I was like, whoa, I'm not sure we've thought through everything. And now it's the middle of January, and I'm like, I am feeling like we're in much better shape to address the kinds of concerns that you're talking about, and we'll be in even better shape when these things go live. All right, let's, let's, uh, that was a very nice segue from um, uh, fears to happiness. Let's go to our second uh, poll, which is what is the biggest threat of AI? We got four options here. Benefit. Sorry. You big, said threat. Did I say threat? You yeah. did. Because you're just in that mode. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm usually a constructive optimist, but I, clearly my brain has been warped. What is the biggest benefit of AI? We get four options. Economic growth, health medicine advances, improved efficiency, or better data analysis. Let's go around the room and just quickly say which one you vote for. Ian. Uh, economic growth. Yeah. Productivity and growth. I would say all of the above. As a benefit. I think they're all benefits, but if you're making me pick one, I'll go with the first as well in terms of growth. Well, I would have said improved efficiency first, followed slightly by health medicine advances, followed a little bit by better data analysts, and last economic growth, just based on my opinion. Let's see. What, oh, the audience matches that exactly. 34% <laughs> for improved efficiency, 33% for health medicine advances. Ian, why do you not like your followers? Uh, I love my followers. <laughs> but as you know, I, no, I specifically say in my pinned tweet that if you you should follow people you disagree with. Ah, so I'm really genius. aligning with that. Why well. did you pick economic? Why, okay, let me ask you this. Not answer why you picked economic growth, but also why you think such a small percentage of the people who responded picked that. Well, I, I think there's overlap between improved efficiency uh, and economic growth. I think you know, in part, it's construction of the data set. Um, you know, it, it is. We we see when you talk about AI, you talk about productivity gains. Um, and there's no question that, I mean, that, that's what everyone's been talking about in a recessionary cycle and an inflationary cycle. So it could be that people are thinking in the next year, they know that we are heading into a you know, contraction. The IMF has said 2023, they expect to be a global recession, 2% global growth. That is not where we want to be. And in that environment, trying to convince people that, oh, AI is coming with the economic growth, there may be cognitive dissonance with that. I'm thinking about what AI is going to unlock in terms of so many new technologies, in terms of distance learning, in terms of agriculture, in terms of data analysis around climate change. I'm more concerned than anything around the impact that the tens, the hundreds of trillions of dollars of damage that climate will wreak upon the global, upon humanity and as a consequence in the global economy. I think AI is the best shot to make meaningful impacts on that in the near to medium term, given how, how long we've waited. Because we can use dealing. it to plant crops more efficiently, set the solar cells the right yeah, direction. Understand exactly what the metrics of the planet really are to get us the efficiency so that the gains that we get from the investments we make are massive. So for me, that means that AI means not just economic growth, but avoiding economic meltdown. For me, that's number one. Hmm. Azim? Well, there's a thing called the productivity J-curve with new technologies. We, we don't know how to use them at the beginning, so we, we waste a lot of time, and then eventually we figure out what to do with them, and it races away, and we saw this with the typewriter, and we've seen it with IT, and we're gonna see it with AI. We, companies have now got used to it. They will make use of these technologies, and within my, my own firm, we are already using these generative AI uh, tools. One of our, my favorite uses of, of ChatGPT is um, I, I'll write an, an analysis, I'll send it to ChatGPT and say, critique this as if you were Professor so and so, or critique this as if you were Professor X Y, and I'll get this critique back of my writing, and I'll go back in and I'll say these are relevant points. Now I should improve it, and if I had to do that. Without ChatGPT's assistance, I would have had to email the professor. She wouldn't have had any time. I'd have had to chase her up. She still wouldn't have had any time. And now I've got this slightly dumb professor helping me improve the quality of my outputs. And then we use it to, to generate the images for the, for the PowerPoint presentations. Sorry for those of you who have to watch my PowerPoint presentations. They're all created by AI systems. But these are real productivity improvements in my work, which is white collar work. I like the productivity J curve. I was trying to think of what the productivity curve for most social media is, and I think it's a P curve. You go around in a circle and then you plummet to the yes, bottom. <laughs> yeah. um, but but could, I, could I just say that take that point, to me it really does take us back to what I see as the two fundamental roles of this technology, a tool for critical thinking and creative expression. 
you know, the notion of can I get somebody to look at what I've written and give me feedback so I can think more critically. It's helping you use your mind in new ways. And then you're able to use that, and a variety of people can, to be more creative with your own expression, to write better, to integrate concepts. And you know, one of the things that I think is so interesting about this that makes me quite enthusiastic is this is, I think, a tool that I hope should be our goal to help reach everybody, regardless, regardless of your education level, regardless of your income level. And you know, technology hasn't really, broadly speaking, done that. In the 30 years of this enormous technology diffusion, you've seen a widening of the income divide between people with more education and people with less. If we can equip people with this, these two capabilities, just maybe we can put ourselves on a path to address one of the problems of our time. I got to jump in. So I, so I completely agree with that. And the idea that you get the technology into the hands of people and they use it is, and develop critical thinking is how you solve the disinformation problem that has exploded and that will explode. I think that's the only way is if people it's normalized, you, you know how to think about what these tools can do and how people are using them. That's a big part of cultural education. Similarly, on the economic disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement problem or concern, you've got to get the technology into the hands of everyone. And if you fail to do that, then you really exacerbate global income inequality. So one of the things that makes me optimistic about AI on the productivity and growth side is that either Brad's right, in which case it is going to be this incredible efficiency tool that's going to allow us to actually really level up, even though I hate that term, all these people that otherwise don't have access to the kinds of education, critical, critical thinking that they really need, or this is going to be incredibly displacing of like everybody's labor. And that doesn't worry me. It would worry me if it displaced the bottom 10%, the bottom 20%, if it was like that. Because then you've got a whole bunch of people that are really in power that are like, OK, we'll say we're going to do something, but we don't really care. But if AI turns out to displace everybody's jobs, if it starts to actually hit the top 10%, the people who actually have influence over policy and their kids, God forbid, <laughs> then those are people that are going to make regulatory changes. They will demand it. And you'll actually have the technology driving a change in how society and the social contract and governance works. That's OK, too. It's only when you have technologies that nibble away at the disenfranchised, at the, at the people that are at the bottom of the barrel or the middle classes that we don't necessarily care but about. Right? Isn't That's that what's going to happen? Right? I mean, if you think about the jobs that are super high risk of AI right now, call center employees around the world. Right? That job is going to go away right? because AI is going to do it. Truck drivers, once we have self-driving cars, they're most likely to come to truck drivers. You're going to have whole classes of jobs that are not at the very high end of the income levels that are going to be wiped away. That's not great at all. Well, some people, including Sam Altman, are saying that it's actually the creative jobs. That, artistic, that could be too. Writing. It's, it's higher end yeah. than the drivers. That's my point. It'll get rid of all, I anyway, guess, there are lots of, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's leave us Nick, that's Nick that's you're us. in trouble, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Nick. yeah, it's that's, really that's, Nick. It's really all about Nick. Yeah. That's yeah. why I'm pivoting to television, because then you have holograms here. All right, let's move to regulation so we can make sure that I still have a job, which is the most important regulation to have. So, trickiest aspect of this issue is regulation. Tech advances happen at pace far too fast for governments and policymakers. So we asked a question. Let's go to poll number three. Who should regulate development of AI? Governments, private sector, multilateral organizations, or no one? And the winner was no one. Just kidding. The winner was governments, 45%. Oh, wow, private sector, 7%. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. Multilateral organizations, 36%. No one gets 12. Oh, some hardcore libertarians yeah, in your follower it's, crowd. It's Silicon Valley group. I, I, I got a point on this one, which is that um, Edelman just came out with their annual mm -hmm. trust index, and they are trumpeting the fact that the private sector is trusted like never before, and people want to hear from their employers because they want to understand what's really going on, that they're the people they're connected to, and that is true, and that is helpful, but that is very different from the people that make the rules. Mm -hmm. They do not want their companies making rules. They still want the governments and the multilateral organizations ultimately making rules. And it's important to recognize that disconnect. Absolutely. Yeah. It's got to be the government. I mean, it's got to be that the regulations have to have a source of democratic legitimacy. Uh, it, it, so it has to be the governments. And in, if you're in Europe, it's the EU. And that's, that's how, how it works there. Uh, and the other reason is that ultimately the state is 
the final arbiter. You know, the state is the one that has the judges and the prison cells and the enforcement mechanisms and the le legitimacy. And uh, the idea that you but, might. But, but the, the state's so bad. I mean, it's so, it's so mm. slow at doing it, right? I mean, Eileen, mean, you, you disagree. I think you didn't have the right answer in the poll. <laughs> which was multi-stakeholder approach. You need, you need all, all of, of the above, all and the above. you didn't even mention... I was waiting for the all of the above yeah. in number well, eight. Well, yeah. you, it's not only all of the above. You didn't really mention civil society. And in technological regulation and, and policy development, that has to be part of the equation. And government, I, you know, of course, at the table, and it's really important and has democratic accountability. But doing it without the input of the technology but companies, I, technologists, correct, or civil yeah. society is not right. Absolutely. And, and, and I completely agree, and I would pull on that thread in two ways. First, think about what is happening right now. Companies are innovating, which is what companies do best, really. Governments uniquely make the rules. They're called laws and regulations. As companies will have to have high standards and controls, will have to comply with government regulation. And I think that the role of civil society is of paramount importance, which, by the way, works best when it has access to the information and can use the technology itself, mm -hmm. which is what happens when you open mm -hmm. this up. You give everyone a voice. Mm -hmm. Now, then I'll just say, think about what we're going to experience. This will be, I think, a very interesting experiment over the next three years. Take ChatGPT. Ask it the question, is the leader, the head of state of my country, an effective or good or bad leader? You can fill in any country. What you are almost certain to get is different people have different views. Here are the arguments in f that w about this leader being effective. Here are the arguments about this leader being ineffective. That is a testament not only to the technology model, the values, but fundamentally, I'll call it democracy. Mm -hmm. Deliberative democracy. Yeah. There will come a day when there will be an AI model that is produced in China. We will all be able to compare. When the question is asked, is the leader of this country effective, will that use the same approach and say, some people say yes, some people say no, or will it be yes or no? That is when Western and democratic philosophy meets authoritarianism in a way that will be easier for people to compare and contrast than is often the case. Wait, so you're arguing that it is a good thing because we will be able to see the clear difference in the AI models, not it is a bad thing because people in China will be have a new mechanism for extremely effective propaganda? Well, I, I'm not going to predict what the Chinese model will be until we get to see it. But if the Chinese answer is, yes, this person is good, or no, that person is bad, and the answer to a subjective question is an absolute, then the world is never before, I would argue, going to have this really interesting opportunity to talk about where technology meets human rights. I mean, it'll have an opportunity, of course, but whether or not enough people are willing and capable of using that opportunity in ways that are constructive, or whether we still have incredibly divided populations that are not prepared to listen to, to ingest a, there are two sides to this conversation. I mean, well, again, I think that the, the chat GPT, <laughs> multiple sides, the chat GPT model, I mean, you can listen to a whole bunch of stuff on PBS, and if you're over 70 and you're, you know, sort of in, like, awake at that time, you can turn to it. Yeah. But that is not the way most Americans are getting their news. And so I fear that this is not only about having having the appropriate tools, but also having the structural environment that facilitates that. And of course, the yeah. Chinese will ensure, as they roll this out, that that is the thing. I mean, we're in an environment right now where so many people ask me, well, so Putin's failing so obviously, economically, geostrategically, I mean, diplomatically, in every way he's failing. So when's he going to be out? And the answer is, inside Russia, the level of support for Putin may well be higher than it was before the war started. That information environment with all the technology around it is one that they are able to control. And I, I worry deeply that the Chinese will be more effective with their population in three and five years' time with this AI than perhaps the Americans and other democracies will be with our new technology. But, I, I, but I, think, I think that Brad's uh, thought experiment is a really powerful one because yeah. you could put that question and a whole class of other questions into the system and you could put where, and, and it's hard to see the Chinese state 
doing anything other than providing a yes or no answer. And then you could put analogous questions in. And, and China has an educated population. They'll see the weaknesses in, in, the, in, in those, uh, uh, those answers and those responses. And the clarity, the understanding that this information system is being controlled will be even higher than it is today. Uh, and so so it, in a funny way, it's, it, it feels to me like it's a little bit of a threat to any kind of uh, autocracy that's trying to control information. Because once you control the information about, uh, about the leader, you're also going to be visibly having to not control it around pain relief or something else that's trivial. So that's quite a hard position you've put them in. Exactly. That's <laughs> why I say this is a huge opportunity, if we think it through and do it right, to make this a tool for critical thinking, to help people expand the spectrum of information they're getting. You don't want it ever to become something where people then take every answer at face value, to be honest. Mm -hmm. What you really want to do is get people exposure to both sides of an issue and then the ability easily to go out and learn more. And Ian, you're absolutely right. No one technology or tool can ever solve the problems of such a divided world. But can we use this as a tool to try to address some of these divides that are so important in the world. That I, is the goal. Eileen, do you agree? It seems like everybody is agreeing that actually ChatGPT would be a tool for information that can actually help. I think it can be a tool for both, and it depends on who's ahead in getting it into the hands of, of I was going to say, users. I think Ian's uh, comment about what China is going to be able to do in terms of social engineering with these kinds of tools and control of the information realm is because it's in the hands of the government. If it's in the hands of the people and citizens, I think it has the potential to lead to greater that's critical right. thinking and the ability to see when you're getting propaganda. And that's the question. I, and I don't want to be a controversialist uh, about this, but I think the, the, the way the Chinese control their information system is inimical, inim, inim, inimical. You got it right, yeah. I got it right. Yeah. Uh, eventually, it's the altitude of Davos uh, to uh, open-ended research. I mean, open-ended research means you should be able to ask any kind of question. And we are just at the foothills of what we can do with AI and other advanced technologies. So if you're in a society where you, there are certain things that you can't ask, but you don't know what you can't ask, and the, 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 the penalty for asking those things you don't know that you can't ask is very high, I think it will start to limit the capabilities of researchers to to explore. When I look at the US or, or Europe, I see much freer societies. I get worried about academic freedom closing down because of culture war issues, because I think our real fundamental strategic advantage at this moment of exponential change in technology is that people have the freedom of thought to think and challenge in their process of research. And China may, with all, have all of these advantages of the demographics and the state direction. But that is for exploitation. It's not for exploration. We're in a phase of exploration. And I think it's advantage democracies. China has no demographic advantages, but that's not what we're talking mm -hmm. about right now. Uh, but on the, I agree with you completely that this is going to be a serious problem for China's ability to economically innovate if that's being driven by human beings. Right? It's going to hurt entrepreneurship. It's going to hurt human capital development. But it is going to strengthen top-down political stability. Mm -hmm. That has been the direction of travel. What we've seen from Xi Jinping is his willingness to deploy his political capital to ensure political stability at the expense of economic growth has thus far been high. Now, over the last two days, we've seen from the Chinese leadership that they are intending to change that message. Do we believe it? We'll see. I am skeptical. <laughs> All right, let's move to our final concluding poll. We have one more poll today. G Zero asked their followers this final question. The long-term impact of AI on society will be A, mostly positive, B, mostly negative, C, too soon to tell. Here's how people voted. Mostly positive, 30%. Mostly negative, 23%. Interesting optimism there. Mm, yeah. Too soon to tell, which seems kind of where we all are at 47%. All right, so I want you to each conclude with one thought on the long-term impact. I did notice that it is interesting that if you go through these different, three different sections, part one, biggest risk is to democracy. Mm -hmm. Part two, biggest benefit will be the way we can all educate and learn. Part three, there's a way it will challenge authoritarianism. There's a little bit of a asynchronicity in mm -hmm. between yeah. the three of them. Not that it can't both be the case that it's a threat to democracy, but also can help in all these ways. In any case, one big thought on the ultimate effect that AI will have, and then we'll wrap this up. Mr. Bremer. My biggest thought, I think, is that um, the speed 
of AI development and transformation makes me somewhat more pessimistic about the implications globally because of the ability of political systems and institutions to react rapidly enough. This is not climate change, where we're eventually getting it right, but it took us decades. We have to act a lot faster on this one. Azim. And that's true. But if we can take the advantages of AI and make the changes that we need, which are hard changes, they're about uh, agency, they're about subsidiarity, they're about localism, then I think we can take ourselves to a much higher energy level where people feel more part of a society. All right. Eileen? I would say this technology is not going away. Somebody, lots of people are going to be developing it. We can't hold it back. And it better be pushed by the right people. And therefore, I try to stay optimistic that we will and hold on to that idea that the, the good guys beat the bad guys. And I would say, I always feel like when people ask, should we be optimistic or pessimistic, I'd say, we should be determined. Mm. And we should be determined in this instance to ensure that this technology is used and deployed and developed responsibly and ethically. Ensure that it really advances economic competitiveness, protects national security. That we find ways to spread the economic benefits broadly so that it equips more people to gain in their lives. And we need to think hard about what it means for, frankly, a younger generation that in some ways is struggling with a mental health pandemic, in part because I think of the impact of technology. Hmm. Let's make sure that this doesn't replace interaction with others, but is a tool that brings people together to think more critically, to create more expressively. But it's only going to be what we make it, and nothing less. All right, well, that wraps it up. So everybody, please go run some queries on ChatGPT and then go hug your mom. All right, <laughs> that does it. I'd like to thank Brad Smith, Eileen Donahoe, Azim Azar, and Ian Bremer for being here. Thanks to all of you for watching around the world. You can follow G0's coverage of the 2023 World Economic Forum by heading to g0media.com. I'm Nicholas Thompson. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you.